There we go. Can you all hear me? I'm coming through? Perfect. Good. Well, good morning, Noahwood. It is good to see you again this Sunday morning. What a joy it is to gather together as we worship our God uh, in song and giving and hearing from God's Word. Uh, This morning we'll be in Luke 2, verses 1 to 7. Uh, But first, let me pray for us as we get into God's Word. Heavenly Father, God, may we stand in awe of you, of your holiness, your majesty, and your power as we read from your Word this morning. God, your word is truth, and may we see it rightly as that. Lord, grant us a hunger for your truth. Lord, guide us in wisdom and understanding that we would know the meaning of this text and how it points us to Christ. Lord, increase our love for you and for one another, and Lord, help us apply this passage to our lives today, that we would be challenged and changed by your word through the working of your spirit, and that we would be obedient followers of Christ. Lord, help me to preach your word with boldness and gentleness, that you will be centered, that you will be glorified as you continue to save and sanctify your people. And I pray all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Uh, So I'm going to start with the questions. Have you ever gotten a gift that wasn't something you really wanted? I'm sure all of us have probably had that experience before. I know I have. There's times that um, I've gotten shampoo before, body wash, things like that, Um, you know, something that is nice in a sense, but when you kind of open it, you don't have that great joy that maybe you'd have if someone gave you, like, a new car or something. That would be nice. (laughs) I don't know if anyone's had that experience before. Or, like, a new phone, right? Uh, Certain gifts may bring us a bit more joy than other ones, right? And... Maybe when you get that gift, sometimes you can start to feel like, well, maybe this person doesn't know me that well, or maybe they don't care about me as much as I thought they did. We can start to question, when we look at this gift, like, is this what my friendship means to you? Is this what our relationship is? Is, you know, a bottle of shampoo, that's it, right? And so I want to ask, do you ever believe that God doesn't love you? I think we've all been at that point in our life at some time, too, right? You know, we can ask, how can the creator of the world, holy and perfect God, really love us and consider us and find joy in us? I pray that through reading this account of Jesus' birth in Luke 2, that we'd be reminded of a God who's in control, who humbled himself, and who has relentless love for us. So let me read from Luke 2, and if you want to turn there with me, we'll be in Luke 2, uh, starting in verse 1. So Luke 2 reads, In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there's no place for them in the inn. I just found this account in the Bible was quite strange as it declares the birth of Jesus, but it's so straightforward in its facts. But it's interesting that as we look deeper into this passage, we get such a deep theology of God, of who he is, and of a humble Savior that came to earth and, uh, as a baby. And so the first thing we read as we go through this passage Uh, is that Luke has given a specific time by explaining who was in power during the birth of Christ. We can be certain Luke is not pointing to some myth or legend, but a true historic event in real time. This passage actually opens up to quite a dire situation in history, and the beginning of the passage, verses 1 to 3, seems almost secular in a sense. There's no mention of God's hand or power being displayed. At first glance, it seems someone else's hand is making the moves, and someone else's voice is calling the shots. 
See, in these days, it said, there was a decree that went out from Caesar Augustus, who was also known as Octavian. And Augustus was the Roman emperor, a man who desired power and fought his way up to get it. He was known for his defeat of Antony and Cleopatra, and the first to actually be called Augustus, which means holy or revered, and a term that was used when referring to gods. They hailed him as Savior, and some going farther, calling him Savior of the world. The whole of civilized world was ruled by one master, whom through some would say there was peace. But it was a dark peace, one that was ruled by abuse of power and fear. And God's people, although they were in the promised land, they were certainly not free. The Jews were under dominion and taxation of a foreign power. And so the world at this time clearly proved that they did not know God, nor did they have any desire to acknowledge him. Yet our God is not one to allow his plan to be thwarted. In fact, he uses these very people to bring about his own perfect plan. Unbeknownst to the world or to Caesar, God's plan was perfectly played out. It was indeed a time for the Messiah to come, for Christ to be born, the true Savior of the world, and God perfectly knew and planned that to be so. What a contrast, then, that we can see as God directs the far-reaching hand of Caesar, his power and oppression, the worldly proclaimed Savior of the world, to be the mechanism which sets in motion the events leading to the humble birth of Christ in Bethlehem the true Savior of the world. And these events were not God acting in a haphazard, reckless manner, but in his wisdom and providence, he perfectly establishes that he is the one true God as he orchestrates the coming of his Son into the world. Mary and Joseph were planned. Caesar and his decree was planned. The journey to Bethlehem and the birth of Jesus there was planned. In fact, it was prophesied to be so 700 years earlier, which we can read in Micah 5.2. Micah 5.2 says, But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me, one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient of days. This was planned by God from the beginning, and he always remained in control and continued to keep his promises. But how often can we forget this very fact? God is in control. When circumstances of our world or your life seems chaotic, confusing, difficult, or oppressive, God is in control. When other people seem to be in power, they seem to be making the calls and calling the shots, they seem to be getting everything that they want, God is still in control. Nothing gets past him, nothing surprises him, nothing happens without, without him saying so. And God is right there every time saying, trust in me. Look at my promises I have given long ago. Look at my faithfulness. See the love that I have for you in all of this. Word of a reminder of truth that we have in Psalm 31, which says, My time is surely in God's hands. Circumstances may get rough, and they might be rough right now for you. They might be confusing. You might not understand what God is doing or why he has allowed what he has allowed to happen. It might not be going the way that you want, but God remains in control over all, and his plans are far greater than our own. And we can see that in this very account of the birth of Christ. Mary and Joseph had all the reason to question, didn't they? To complain, to wonder, what is God doing? You know, he started all this, so why are we now going to Bethlehem? Why does Mary have to get up from her hometown while she's pregnant and go to Bethlehem? Right? Why am I going to be giving birth in a strange country? Why is there no room for us in the inn? Right? God really is a great marriage counselor, isn't he? 
Right? I'm sure there are tears. There's definitely pain. And there are questions. But we can see that Mary and Joseph still held on to the fact that God was in control. They didn't know the whole story, but they knew what they needed, and the rest they left to faith, and that God had bigger and greater plans than what even they could fully comprehend. They just had to trust and obey. Perhaps Mary was reminded of her song of praise she sang in Luke 1, reflecting on God's strength and control over all things, and with her own eyes actually seeing these things unfold before her. In Luke 1, verse 51 to 52, it reads, He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. Again, what a contrast we see, right, at the beginning of this account of Caesar Augustus putting out a decree for the whole world to be registered. But unbeknownst to him, God was working his plan. God was bringing down the mighty from their thrones and exalting the humble. And it points us to the next thing that we can see within this account, which is the circumstances of Jesus' birth shows us a humble Savior. If we've just seen God's sovereignty so clearly in this, then that means that the lowly circumstances to which Jesus was born was also part of God's sovereign plan. It was no accident that Mary and Joseph were chosen as his parents. It was no accident that he was born in the little town of Bethlehem, and it was no accident that there was no room in the inn, and no accident that the Son of God would come to earth in flesh, born as a baby and put in a manger, In these humble circumstances of the birth of the Son of God, we can see a God of unspeakable love. This account is full of contrasts as we see um, in the coming of Christ what we would expect of the Son of God, of the creator of the world, of the King of Kings, and the welcome that Jesus actually got. He wasn't born in a palace with a royal family surrounding him, Uh, with servants catering to his every need. Christ was born to two nobodies as his earthly parents. Poor and insignificant, uneducated, and definitely not anyone's first choice um, to bring in a king. But God is not limited by the ability or worth of a person. He used who he desired and does so to display his power and glory by bringing down the proud and raising up the humble. Jesus also wasn't placed on a throne, but he was put in a manger, a feeding trough for animals. Because there's no room for him in the inn. What a God that perfectly plans for his own son to not have a room that would lead him instead to be laid in a manger. What humility that showed. Right? God wasn't like, ah, good, I got them to Bethlehem. Wait a second. I forgot to book them a room to stay in. Right? He didn't do that. This is all part of his plan. This is all to show the humility of our Savior to display the humility of Jesus, the King of Kings laid in a feeding trough, surrounded by animals, met later by shepherds, the lowliest in society. By being born of the lowliest to begin with and born in the lowliest of places, God showed that he was coming for the poor and powerless. Emmanuel, God with us, accessible to all, right? All could come to him. All could seek him. All could know him. All could rest in him. In a world that worshipped the powerful, the important, the impressive, the high status, those who were elite and exclusive and proud, the Son of God came and flipped the whole world order upside down. However, the most humbling aspect of this whole thing is the fact that Jesus came to earth in flesh at all. 
we see right in the text that he was actually born. In verse 6, And while they were there, the time came for her, Mary, to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son. And as we read in Colossians 1.15, it says that he, speaking about Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Mary's firstborn son was the firstborn of all creation. What an amazing fact. Does it not just drop your jaw in awe of our God? This is what we call the incarnation. God come down in the flesh, 100% God, 100% man, just like we talked about with the kids in family worship. God knew that Jesus needed to come. We needed someone who was representing humanity to pay the price for our sins. And Jesus, although he was God, became a real human, not just a human in appearance. The all-powerful, all-knowing, all-present Son of God did not give up these attributes, but placed the exercise of his deity under the submission of God the Father. He had a real human body and mind and emotions and feelings and all the inherent human weaknesses that we have and experience. Jesus, remaining infinite God, became finite man. The creator of the stars was now sleeping beneath them. As Philippian 2 tells us, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. The humility of Christ was a way of life all the way from his birth to his death. He submitted to the Father's will in humility, fully aligned with him. And this points us to the gospel. We needed a humble Savior. We needed a God who would humble himself to come to earth, to live a life in humility, to point us to God, to make a way for us to know God as our Father and as our Savior. By humbling himself even to the obedience to death, on a cross when he was not guilty. So the manger points us to the cross and to the grave, and this is how we are saved. By the humility of our Savior, we are saved by believing for sure that Jesus humbled himself in becoming a man and dying on the cross for our sins. And this is how we are called to live according to the pattern of his humble birth and saving death. That he rose again that the judgment and wrath of God for our sins was paid in full. It was finished. And he rose again, and we can believe in him and rest in that promise that we are truly saved and will have eternal life with God in heaven. The humility of Christ ought to humble us. How can we not be humbled when we look at the humility of him? should humble us to accept this free gift of salvation, of sins forgiven through belief in God and repentance of our sins, of turning away from this old lifestyle and being made new by God's hand. Walking in the same humility and life of Christ as God makes us new, that we would love and worship him with our life, looking forward to eternity, glorifying him forever in heaven because we can know and serve a God who came to earth to show us the way to him. A God who can sympathize with us, as it says in Hebrews 4, 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. He was a perfect sacrifice for us. The only way to forgiveness of sins, the price for those whose sins are paid, to know God as your Father and uh, 
you as his child and to spend eternity with him in heaven. That call is open. That gift is there. That free gift of love that God has shown us. And you can accept that gift through belief and repentance of God. And so the account of Christ points us to a relentless nature of God's love. It shows us God's deep love for us as he remained in control, as this was all part of his plan, including the humbling circumstances of our Savior. What an amazing God that we serve who came to earth to seek and save the lost, the poor and powerless, the low, the low and humble. That there is no other way for us to be saved, but his love drove him to humble himself and come to earth. <clears throat> and so this is something that we can uh, learn from this passage Uh, The first question I want to ask is, in the circumstances of our world and of your personal life, how are you resting in a God who is sovereign? There's a lot of things that we can probably say are going wrong right now in our world or in uh, your personal life. Difficult situations, oppression, struggle, pain, hurt, loss. Our world is still waiting the coming of Christ when all will be redeemed. But until that time, are we resting in the God who is in control? Are we resting in the God who worked the hand of Caesar Augustus, the one that the world thought was in control, to bring about a Savior to save us? Are we resting in the fact that he does have a plan that he does know our hurt and our pain and that he calls us to trust in him even when it's difficult what would it look like in our life as individuals and as a church if we were truly trusting in God if we were really resting in him one thing that came to my mind is that I would be complaining a lot less and praying a lot more. I can complain pretty easily. <laughs> I'm guilty of that for sure. Right? Maybe not always out loud, but even in my head. But how often do I actually turn to the God who is in control, call out to him, cry out to him, right, like the Psalms, but always resting in the fact that his will will be done and that we can rest in that. What a joy it is that we can rest in that fact that he is in control. The next thing I want us to see is the humility of Christ and what he calls us to. That we are called to live with the same humility as him. And I'm sure everyone here has probably felt not good enough for God. The thing is, is that that is actually a good thing. Because the reality is, is that we really aren't. There's nothing that we can do to deserve the salvation that God offers us through Christ. We aren't good enough. But because of Jesus, you are. When you rest in what Christ has done, Sure, this does not bring us humbly to our knees. I'm nothing apart from Jesus. I am chaff. I'm a candle that is blown out in a second. Right? I'm a little speck within this gigantic universe, but in Christ, I'm a child of the God who created it all. How can we be living more humbly in our lives as we reflect on the humility of Christ that he came to earth as a baby? That he was born in a little town of Bethlehem when there was no room in the inn, laid in a manger, surrounded by animals, 
met and praised by shepherds, all to point us to the fact that only in him are we good enough, are we saved, are we forgiven, do we truly have salvation. Through our belief in Christ that he came and died and rose again to pay the price for our sins. What an amazing, humble God that we serve. And lastly, do we find joy in the gift of Jesus? In this amazing gift of love that he shows us? I want you to think about the greatest gift that you have ever received. Do you remember how it was wrapped? Do you remember how big or small it was? Do you remember who gave it to you? Right? We remember those gifts. I remember getting, I didn't put a picture up, but there's a picture of me one Christmas. My parents went through great lengths to get us a Nintendo Wii. If any of you guys had one of those, that's good. Um, <laughs> but uh, there's a picture of me somewhere on Facebook. Maybe I'll share it at some point. Me holding the box. I have the biggest grin and smile on my face. I was so excited. Apparently my dad had to wait outside for like four hours to get it, to get a ticket to then go and get it later on. It was crazy. It's a good story. You should ask them about it. <clears throat> but I want to ask you this question. When you think about the greatest gift that you, you've gotten, how long did that joy last? You know, maybe a day. Maybe a week, maybe a couple months, maybe a year. If I think about it now, our we, I think, is down in our basement, collecting dust. We don't really play it much anymore, right? But Jesus offers us a joy that lasts. It lasts forever. It's a joy that nothing can take away. No circumstances not even death, can take away the joy that we have in Christ. Do you find joy in this everlasting gift of love through Christ? You have a choice this Christmas season to either accept this gift of Christ or to reject it. The truth is difficult to take at times, but God has laid it out clearly that no one will come to him except through Christ. So are you trusting in Jesus today? Are you finding joy in him, in humility and love that he has shown us, that he also calls us to show God and to show others with our lives? Are you still walking, trying to make yourself good enough, trying to find joy and happiness in other things that the world tries to offer us? Christ calls us to be like him in putting others first and taking the lowliest place for ourselves. I pray that we never forget that although he is the son of God, the savior we serve was wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid in a manger as a baby because there's no room for him at the end. If you haven't put your trust in this God and you want to, I pray that you come talk to me or Pastor Nate or someone who brought you here. We would love to share the good news of Christ who came as a baby, who died on the cross for our sins and rose again and offers us eternal new life in him. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, God, may be in awe of you. Our jaws dropped as we look at this, what seems to be such a simple account of a man who was in power, who made a decree of two nobodies who went from one town to another, a long journey, and a baby who was born in a little town who had no room in the end, God, but was laid in a manger. And this was your son, Jesus Christ, who is the true savior of the world. 
what humble circumstances he was born in, God, may we just be in awe of you, that you are in control. God, in our own circumstances that we face, God, forgive us of those times that we do not trust in you. God, that we stumble away, that we don't turn to you, but turn to other things that we try to find joy and peace in, God. But may we rest in you, the Prince of Peace, the joy of the world, Emmanuel, who is God with us. God, may we show the same humility that you have shown us through Christ. May we rest in him, in his sacrifice on the cross, in the good news of the gospel, God, that he rose again, he paid the price for our sins. God, your judgment was <clears throat> paid for. The wrath was fully poured out. It was finished, God. It was accomplished. And God, this is the greatest gift that we can ever receive. May we find joy in that today, God, and forever. As we are reminded by your word each and every day, as we spend time in your word and in prayer, God, seeing who you are and what you have done, God, I pray that we would show this same love and humility towards one another, that we would be unified as one body under you, God, as your church, that we would go and share this gift of Christ. The greatest gift that we can give is you. And so may we reflect you in your love and humility, God, as we rest in your plan, God, that you are in control. God, we have nothing to fear. May we rightfully fear you as the God who's in control, God, and go and be what you have called us to be. God, I thank you for who you are. I pray that we would leave here glorifying you in awe of who you are, saying what a great God that we know and serve. God, we thank you for the gift of Christ. And may we continue to worship you. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.